From a studio high above the clouds of the Okanagan Valley, this is the Cannabis Podcast. Exploring the world of Canadian cannabis culture, one toke at a time. Now, here's your host and bud tender, Gary Johnston. And welcome back once more to the Cannabis Podcast. If this is your very first visit, well, you're in for an experience kind of focused on cannabis for the next 30 or 40 minutes. And if that's a focus that makes sense to you, well, welcome along for the ride. We have some interesting topics today. I finally managed to achieve a high through cannabis cuisine consumption. You get to come along for the ride on that, and I hope you're ready to giggle a bit. We look at the fragmentation of the Canadian cannabis industry, a study that shows that the pre-legalization hysteria over cannabis and driving was way, way overemphasized. And you know the world's changed when Amazon is trying to hire cannabis consumers as drivers. And speaking of consumption, on Cultivar Corner, a long overdue review of some fine cannabis grown at home in Ontario by my friend Josh. All of that and more on episode 80 of the Cannabis Podcast. And as per usual, before we dive into the first story, a shout out, shout out to Frank. Frank was a customer in the store. This was actually probably a couple weeks ago. I was a little reticent in talking about it and mentioned that he loves listening to the podcast. So thanks, Frank. Thanks not only for being a customer, but thanks for being a listener. It's always fun to have more people join the ride. So we go to mjbizdaily.com for the first story of this episode. The Canadian cannabis industry is increasingly fragmented despite mergers and acquisitions and record sales. Citing data from analytics firm HiFire, the report notes that the top five licensed producers represented less than 40% of the Canadian market in August, down substantially from a year ago, when the producers accounted for more than half of all retail sales. Similarly, the top nine cannabis producers accounted for almost 80% of the market last year, but that has fallen to a combined 62%. The fragmentation comes despite months after months of record sales across Canada and significant spending on mergers and acquisitions this year, including the blockbuster combination of Tilray and Afria. Other major M&A deals include Canopy Gross' $435 million Canadian dollar acquisition of Supreme Cannabis, and Hexo's deal to buy Redican for almost Canadian $1 billion. Despite recent acquisitions, the market remains fragmented and highly competitive. Consequently, the analysts lowered their recreational revenue projection for Tilray, noticing a concerning trend for Aurora cannabis sales and flagged potential downside for canopy sales. BMO estimates adult-use cannabis sales in August were Canadian about $349 million. However, the rate of monthly sales growth seems to be decelerating. That means eased pandemic lockdowns probably did not lead to the meaningful sales bump this summer that some executives had predicted. The report found that the pre-roll category continued to eat into flower share of the market. Pre-roll retail sell-through really began to accelerate in March of 2021. And the category continues to steadily outperform. In contrast, flower sales have been flattish in recent months. And I can personally attest to that, that pre-rolls are definitely becoming very, very popular. A lot of people just don't want to take the time or effort to mold their cannabis into joints on their own, so they're prepared to pay what are considerably higher prices for pre-rolls, but they are definitely a big corner of the market. And so there you go. The cannabis market in Canada is definitely fragmented at the moment. Another story I wanted to talk about this episode is this. If you remember, and maybe you will, maybe you won't, Prior to legalization, when legalization was being considered, there were so many groups who made so much noise about how dangerous it was going to be on our roads and all of our streets once cannabis is legalized because people are going to be driving around stoned and there's going to be so many accidents and it's going to be absolutely horrible. Hmm. That didn't seem to happen. This is a study. The story here is from the growthop.com. Neither Ontario nor Alberta, far and away the leaders for the number of cannabis stores in the country, have witnessed a significant rise in emergency visits from traffic-related injuries since weed got the green light three years ago. Implementation of the Cannabis Act was not associated with evidence of significant post-legalization changes in traffic injury emergency department visits in Ontario or Alberta, among all drivers or youth drivers in particular 
notes the new Canadian study in drug and alcohol dependence. Published last week, researchers sought to get firm numbers after some have expressed concerns about how recreational cannabis legalization could influence road-related injuries, particularly with respect to youth drivers. To get to firm numbers, Investigators considered weekly drivers' traffic injuries at all emergency departments in Ontario and Alberta from the start of April 2015, three years before legalization, through to the end of 2019. Participants were broken down by province into two groups, all drivers and those 14 to 17 in Alberta and 16 to 18 in Ontario. There was no evidence of significant changes associated with cannabis legalization on post-legalization weekly counts of drivers' traffic injury ED visits, researchers write. Comparing the pre- and post-legalization periods, they specifically found that the number of weekly traffic injury ED visits in Alberta was up by just 9.17 amongst all drivers and down by 0.66 visits among the young driver group. Research involving driving and cannabis is receiving increasing attention of late. Australian researchers recently concluded road safety risks associated with medicinal cannabis appear similar or lower than numerous other potentially impairing prescription medications. And another Australian study suggested that using CBD does not impair driving performance, and consuming moderate amounts of THC produces only mild impairment lasting up to four hours. I wish, as a bit of a sidebar. (laughs) Still... Canadian students with more relaxed views of weed appear to be more likely to consume and drive than others in their age group. Indeed, slightly more than 10% of Ontario high school age drivers admitted to having driven within an hour after using weed in the last year. Another recently published Canadian study exploring ED visits, albeit related to weed intoxication at a single emergency department in Hamilton, Ontario, found treatment for acute cannabis intoxication was up among 18 to 29-year-olds, but not overall. Now, those numbers differ considerably from a U.S. study out of Colorado, where adult-use cannabis has been legal since 2014. The Associated Press reported in March of 2019 that weed-related ED visits to a Denver hospital witnessed a threefold increase pre- and post-legalization. Investigators in that research pointed to inhaled cannabis and marijuana-infused edibles as the two main culprits for symptoms ranging from vomiting to racing hearts. There was so much hysteria prior to legalization about how dangerous our roads were going to be with all of those crazy cannabis consumers driving their cars. Hmm. Just didn't turn out that way. What this segment is about is, in fact, my final positive experience, or rather my first positive experience, with edibles. It's true. (laughs) Happened last night. And you're going to hear some of the results of that because I was smart enough when I came home from this event and things were really starting to get interesting that I recorded how I was and how I was feeling. And I think you're going to get a chuckle out of it. What happened? Well, it wasn't the traditional method. I went to a cannabis infused four course dinner put on by Travis Peterson. Travis Peterson is the nomad cook and he's been going all across Canada this summer doing infused cannabis meals all COVID uh, protocols in place. All of our tables were separate. Masks before we went in, so all of that was taken care of. But my goodness, what a delicious meal. <laughs> Travis is one fine chef. And and <laughs> again, because of my stone state at the end of the night, I can't really tell you exactly the content and details of each of the four courses, but boy, they were delicious. We started off with a salad that included some chanterelle mushrooms, some oaky mushrooms, and uh, just this delicious sauce that he had created. And I suspect, because every dish had a sauce, I think that's where the cannabis was hidden. (laughs) He gets to every individual before starting and determines your cannabis level and what kind of tolerance you have. And that sets the menu and for how it's going to be introduced to you. And as you were about to hear, it worked really well. (laughs) That's a much more effective method than anything I had tried before. You go to the four-course meal. As you're going through the evening, of course, it starts creeping up on you. And that's, I guess, the thing that really surprised me. I don't know. Every time I've done edibles before, I, I guess I expected it to just be suddenly hit with this one big bang when suddenly everything came to fruition. But that's not the way this worked. I was actually at the table at one point with the the three people that I was sharing the table with, my wife and and two other uh, acquaintances. And I remember sitting back and thinking, this was, I think, after the third, maybe between the second and third course, 
which was probably a period of about 45 minutes to an hour over that, over that space. <laughs> and that's when I'm sitting at the table and I went, oh, I think I'm getting high. I think I'm feeling a buzz. And it carried on well from there. So I wanted to provide a bit of an introduction to what you're about to hear, because <laughs> very clearly I was stoned when this recorded. So I hope you enjoy it. I hope it gives you a chuckle and perhaps it gives you the intrigue to perhaps try a cannabis infused dinner yourself. I have a confession to make. If you have listened to any of these episodes, further episodes, or <laughs> previous episodes <laughs> of <laughs> the Cannabis Podcast, <laughs> I'm getting giggly. <laughs> Uh, I have a confession to make. I think I might have finally gotten off on edibles. <laughs> and if my wife is correct, what I'm recording right now, uh, my speech is <laughs> slurred. I can't actually hear that in my head. In my head, my diction is as elucidatory as it should be. Or, or, or I would hope it to be, but <laughs> it may be that I am speaking with perhaps some slurredness. Is that what you would call it? <laughs> now, If you've listened to any earlier episodes, you know that I have always had a significant problem in achieving a high through edibles. I had taken dosages up to 80 milligrams and felt virtually nothing. <laughs> and <laughs> if you've listened this far, you have probably realized that it worked this time. <laughs> and how I got here was not through what I had tried before. Ingesting some gummies or a chocolate or whatever. And, and eating all of those 80 milligrams at once and waiting and hoping for a buzz. And a buzz that never seemed to arrive. I think I may have learned the way that works tonight. My wife and I had an opportunity to attend a cannabis-infused four-course dinner. And, first of all, it was delicious. <laughs> and secondly, it was pretty effective from a cannabis perspective. Before the meal started, the chef, Travis Peterson, the nomad cook, asked each individual what their preferred dosage was on a scale from one to five. I think one was five milligrams, two was ten, three was twenty-five, four was fifty, and five was a hundred. Now, I had convinced my wife to go. She was very reluctant, and reluctant because we didn't get a whole bunch of details. We had the gifts given to us, and I, so we weren't involved in the pre-planning. We just found out about it basically the, the day of. <laughs> That's when we found out the address, where we went to, and there was, as I say, table setting for... Our table of four, and a four-course dinner. I chose. Well, here's here's where I had a problem, because as I was as I was saying, 
now there's one of those cannabis moments where I got redirected and now I'm going to redirect myself back there. <laughs> That's because my wife went with zero dosage, so she didn't want to have any effects. But she hates driving at night. And so we knew it was going to be into the dark when we were going to be heading home. So I wanted to choose a dosage that was going to give me a, a good high finally and still allow me to drive home. So instead of number five, which if I had a ride available to go home with, I probably would have selected. I'm kind of glad I instead chose four. Because, and maybe, I mean, here's a stoned individual with a hypothesis for how he may have gotten here. And my suspicion is because he was going for a 50 milligram dosage overall from first appetizer through the second and the entree and dessert to 50 milligrams. And I think, plus of course there was a champagne opener, a cannabis infused champagne opener. And that actually may have hit me pretty hard. Started to give me a buzz pretty quickly. And because each course was dosed appropriately to your max, it was such a, such gentle but noticed onset. I remember at one point, now of course it, at any event like this, the table mates are going to determine how good a time you have because you're there to share. And we had fabulous table mates and conversation flowed freely. And I can't remember the point that I was going to make, <laughs> which again is a pretty good indication that I'm pretty freaking high from this. <laughs> and we have no idea how long this is going to last because as we've discussed before on the cannabis podcast, when I smoke a joint, if it lasts half an hour, I think I've gotten a really good deal out of that. But I have a sneaking suspicion this sucker's going to be <laughs> growing and mowing for a long time now, especially the way I feel right now. So we shall see. But I had to put something down to one. Is my wife right? My speech is slurred. Two, document the fact that if applied appropriately in succession at appropriate dosages to sneak up on oneself, but yet demonstrate a high, it may be a very successful way to use edibles. So I have to say now that I can get high from edibles, but it has to be a, I guess that's why low and slow <laughs> seems appropriate. Although perhaps some people wouldn't think 50 milligrams is low. Most of the table mates were at number one. So that gives you an indication of how long I have been using cannabis, I guess is what that gives you an indication of. Perhaps the rambling that's going on now may also be an indication of how high I am. I thought it was time that we demonstrate the fact that, and I can just feel my brain, okay, what the, what, fuck, what freaking word am I going to use there? <laughs> I am having a little bit of trouble communicating right now. <laughs> Which, I mean, it feels good. I'm, I'm, I'm not feeling like, like I can't do stuff as was demonstrated by the fact that I drove home from this event. And I'll let you in on a little secret. I couldn't resist playing a little joke on my wife when we arrived at home. <laughs> the venue where we were having this infused dinner was probably 20K away from where we live. 
So we were coming back. It was, you know, later at night, dark. And this is one area where being an old dude like myself, driving at night in lights is not as easy as it once was. All right, since I forgot to reconnect in real time, I kind of cut back in to get back to... <laughs> See, now I forgot to get about the story that I'm trying to get back to. Uh, I might be really high. I'm coming to that conclusion. Because clarity of thought is not something that's rising to the surface right now. Okay. I remembered. <laughs> Go quick before you forget. Okay, what I remembered was I wanted to tell you what I did when I when I got to the when I came home with my wife. <laughs> okay, go quickly, Gary, before you before you lose it. Okay, so I'm driving home, and I can tell that my wife's a little freaked out because you know she doesn't like driving at night, but she does know that I'm a little high. You no, know, I guess as she, she told me later, my speech was slurry. <laughs> so that was her first indication. So, but I can handle driving in that situation. And I did. No issues coming home. And as I'm coming down the back lane, I guess this is when I'm, I really knew that I was stoned. Because the only thing that's going through my mind is, oh, I'm going to play a trick on her. <laughs> and we pull up to where I parked the car. I slam it into park, and I turn to her and say, Oh, my God, thank God we made it home. <laughs> and I think she thought I was serious. <laughs> but it was it was so much fun to do, and I guess it, again, was another indication of how freaking high I am. Holy I'm honestly glad I didn't do 100 milligrams because I think I would probably be on the couch hallucinating or something like that. But there. So I got the story out about what happened when we got home. Now I'm just going to enjoy the high. And enjoy the high. I did. Uh, it, it didn't last as long as I thought it was going to. I thought it was going to be like, you know, all night kind of thing. But no, it only went another couple hours. But Boy, it sure was a lot of fun. As an aside, and as a bit of a follow-up, I tried to kind of duplicate it. I purchased five cannabis drinks, all 10 milligrams each. Figured there's my 50 milligrams. And I tried to space those over the course of an evening, thinking that that was the trick. It unfortunately failed. So I guess it is truly only cannabis cuisine, which can get me that buzz. But boy, it sure did get me buzzed. And we're going to 420intel.com for the next story, which does have a focus on the United States, but it's just so interesting I thought it was worthy of talking about. It's no secret that one of the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic on business in the United States is a shortage of employees. Against this background, Amazon proposed a solution that has caused controversy. Hire marijuana users as distributors and eliminate cannabis anti-doping. Last June, Jeff Bezos' company decided to stop testing its current and potential workers for marijuana. Now, Amazon is asking its delivery partners to do the same, according to correspondence accessed by Bloomberg. The e-commerce giant invited these small businesses, which operate Amazon vans locally to deliver packages, to loudly announce they no longer monitor candidates for marijuana use. This was in order to increase the number of job applicants and add more staff to their ranks. According to figures from Amazon cited by the outlet, this change could increase the number of job applicants by up to 400%. In contrast, the company claims the detection of marijuana reduces the pool of potential workers by as much as 30%. A delivery partner quoted by Bloomberg said that most prospects failed the drug test for using cannabis. Now that there are only tests for other substances, such as opiates and amphetamines, there are more approved drivers. Many delivery partners prefer to remain strict in their hiring policies and continue to do cannabis anti-doping. This is because, on the one hand, marijuana is not yet legal at the federal level in the United States. That is, it is still illegal in several states. Therefore, it will be difficult to equalize the conditions throughout the country. 
Another aspect that worries the small delivery companies is the implications that this would bring in terms of insurance and liability, as some drivers could use cannabis before going on a delivery route. If one of my drivers crashes and kills someone and tests positive for marijuana, it will be my problem, not Amazon's, an anonymous delivery partner told the outlet. Although the company relaxed its measures and will hire marijuana users, that does not mean that it will allow them to work under its influence. Amazon emphasized that it has a zero-tolerance policy for employees who consume it during business hours. If a delivery partner works under the influence and tests positive after an accident or reasonable suspicion, that person will no longer be allowed to perform services for Amazon, an Amazon spokeswoman said in a statement. Amazon isn't the only company concerned about a worker shortage offering new worker incentives. Earlier this month, Target Corporation announced that it would pay for college for its employees, while Applebee's offered candidates free snacks as part of its strategy to add 10,000 new staff members. So there you go. There is a different tactic you never thought you would hear that Amazon would be dropping the requirement for cannabis testing. But there you go from 420intel.com. You never know where this industry is going next. THC, CBD, terpene profiles, what's in me? Oh, please explain to me. Go to the corner, go to the corner, oh yeah. Go to the corner, please explain this stuff to me. This is a cultivar corner that frankly is a little long overdue. A listener of friend of mine. I consider every single one of you who listens to the podcast a friend of mine in some form. And this particular friend is from Ontario, Southern Ontario. His name is Josh. And Josh, we had some communication earlier in the year. He wanted to share some of his crop with me. Now, why would I turn down an opportunity to share some crop? I didn't. I said, I would love to sample some of your stuff, Josh. And boy, was I amazed when I got the package. Now, and here's where I had been a little reticent because I received this package a while ago and I should have really jumped on this a whole long time ago. But what it contained was, whoa, <laughs> I was very impressed. He had sent me a picture prior to the package actually getting here of a one gram, a mini one gram temple ball of some hash, some bubble hash created using Frenchy Cannoli's method. And he referenced a bunch of videos of Frenchie Cannoli and wanted to make sure that Frenchie got some credit for the hash ball. And, well, that's not what I'm featuring on Cultivar Corner I, uh, because I've smoked it all up. <laughs> I couldn't resist. I found it absolutely delicious. And this is how I consumed most of that hash ball. I pulled off a little bit of it, rolled it all out into a nice little you know, line, a little line of the, just some delightful hashish and laid that on, t on top of one of the joints that I was smoking, depending on, on where my mood was. Boy, did that ever add a delicious taste. And you could track that. You could, you could literally watch on the paper. You could see where that line of hash was as it was burning down the joint. Oh, very, very delicious. So kudos, Josh. The hash, magnifique. Now I'm going to get to the weed. And wow. He sent me three different kinds of weed. I don't actually remember whether I weighed it or not. It was probably, probably about an eighth of each. Well, since I brought it up, now I kind of have to figure that out, don't I? So let me just get the scale out here and see what I got on this guy. Yeah, there you go. One bud. And Josh, good job on the trimming. I think that's something that I mentioned before that I struggle with. And I guess everybody who grows their own weed kind of struggles with that level of trimming that, that gets you to that almost professional stage. But it's so hard to trim off some of those sugar leaves sometimes because you, you almost have an affection for them. But Josh, you, you did an excellent job in terms of the cure. And the one that I decided to choose, Josh, as I said, sent me three different uh, samples. And the one I thought that was worthy of featuring on Cultivar Corner was this one. And this was the Sour Diesel, the Foxtail Gassy Fino. And there is definitely some gassy notes to that. Now, much like I... So the weed was shipped in a smelly proof bag. That's how it got here without any issues. Um, this is a problem that I've had with, with some of my weed too. 
and I don't know whether it because it, maybe I'm dropping terpenes or whatever, but getting that deep, deep aroma is just really difficult. And well, as I say, I can get those gassy notes when I hold the bud right up to my nose, but it's not really deep. But it's a beautiful little bud. There are lots of nice orange pistols in there. Good maturity, it looked like. Take a peek on the jeweler's loop. And, oh, yes. Mm, nice trichome fields. I love seeing that. F fair amount of amber. Oh, that's cool, too. Really looks nice, Josh. Unfortunately, now... In order to sample it, I've, I've got to break up this beautiful bud. So, <laughs> alas, alas, the time has come. I'm taking off just a couple of pieces from the bottom of that big nug. And as I say, it was one three and a half gram nug. And now I go through the work of creating the material for either the joints or the vaporizer. And of course, we'll do both. Smartened up and turned on the vaporizer so by the time I'm done it's ready for me I really feel bad that I haven't gotten to this sooner Josh because you sent me some really nice weed I really am grateful for the fact that you decided to share some with me and I think it's only worthy of a good review here and a review that you get to share with your friends and neighbors if if it turns out to be a good one well, of course, you can share it with him, even if it doesn't turn out to be a good one, because you still went through the effort. And that, that scores major, major points for me, Josh. Well, there we go. I've got the joint ready. Well, almost. I'm just finishing rolling it up. Leaving enough to tap into the Crafty Plus, which just signaled to me that it's ready to rock. So I've got to clear out what's actually in there from a previous moment. Now let me tap some of this inside the crafty. And you know what? Let's start with the crafty. Let's start with the taste and see what the taste of homegrown sour diesel foxtail gassy fino from southern Ontario. Okay, there's definitely more gassy notes when you throw it through the vaporizer. Mmm, nice. Yeah, yeah, there is definitely a little bit of a gassy note to it. Super Sour Diesel, for me, has always seemed to have been a sativa. And hard to say whether the profile of this one will match that. Oh, there's some happy eyes coming up, so maybe it is. Oh, very smooth taste, Josh. You did a good job on the cure. Burns well. Well... At least it does in the vaporizer. Let's find out if it burns well in a joint. And yes, it does. Not as many of those gassy notes. Again, perhaps it's my palate that, why I experience it that way. But smooth. And for me, that's always an issue with homegrown weed. And going back to the first few years that I did it myself and <laughs> left way too many sugar leaves in there. And that ended up with a really, really harsh smoke, especially after it had sat for a while. So this has been in the smelly proof bag for probably now. Well, let's see. What, what was the date that Josh sent me that? Uh, yeah, that was back in August. <laughs> so it has been a little while back in the early part of August. And it is still real nice and fresh. Tastes nice. Smokes in the joint. And let's take a look at the ash. Lots of gray. I'm not seeing a lot of black. It's a smooth burn. I haven't had to refire it up. It's holding its burn well. Mm. 
Well, I just said that, didn't I? <laughs> it could be that I was talking too long in between taking a toke. That could have been the issue there. So let's try to light it up. It is so cool to live in a country now where we can all grow our own weed legally, share it with our friends across the country, and, and revel in the fact that, that we can grow some pretty dark good weed all by ourselves. And to that, I have to add, Josh, you've done one fine job here with the sour diesel foxtail gassy pheno. It appears to be doing a good job on my endocannabinoid system right now. Getting me those ever hopeful, <laughs> happy eyes that I just love to feel when I'm high on cannabis. And there they are. Mm. Oh, and there's a bit of a rush. Mm. Very, very nice. Well, it's taken me a long time to get here, Josh. <laughs> But I finally did, and, and I guess the other regret I have is that I didn't do a uh, a feature on, on that lovely little ball of hash that you sent. And again, kudos to Frenchy Cannoli for the method that Josh used to create that. And uh, boy, that was tasty. <laughs> and and the super sour diesel foxtail gassy fino, pretty tasty as well. And it's given me a pretty good high. Thanks, Josh. As usual, if there is anything you would like to comment on about the Cannabis Podcast, info at CannabisPodcast.com is the email address. You will always find the links that are talked about in the episode at CannabisPodcast.com, where you can also sign up for the newsletter, which really just is in an announcement every Sunday just before the podcast releases, so you never miss an episode. That's it. I, I was thinking that there was more, but no, I think that's it. Episode 70, no. Let me think. Let me start counting again. One, two, three. That's it for episode 80. <laughs> Why am I having so much trouble figuring out what the episode is on this episode, on the episode of this episode? Perhaps it's been the cannabis consumption that has consumed, that has continued while I have been preparing the rest of the podcast. Maybe that reviewer was right. Maybe I am too stoned for me. That wraps it up for episode 80 of the Cannabis Podcast. From the Cannabis Infused Studio. High above the Okanagan Valley, this was the Cannabis Podcast.